Good morning, Grace. Kind of a rainy spring break group today, huh? You guys are all wishing you're on vacation like the rest of the people that took off. Is that what it is? Hey, before we jump in, I want to celebrate a little bit. You may know, uh, many of you know, probably Pastor Brent and Jill uh, had been expecting their very first grandchild, uh, and they took off. And so on Friday, little Alexis was born, uh, and they're celebrating and rejoicing that mom's doing great and the little baby's doing great. So uh, it's obviously for those who know them, uh, it's been a, a long journey and a, a really neat journey of seeing God's faithfulness in their lives. So you can just be praying for them and for their daughter uh, and son-in-law as they make that transition as well. Uh, you may know I announced it a, a while back, but Pastor Brent and Jill are, are beginning their transition now, as you know, March 30th will be his last day here, their last day here on staff. Uh, this was one of those things they knew that as their kids had grandchildren, they wanted to be back near uh, family. So the 30th of this month is when we'll celebrate our last day uh, with them here. And you can just be praying for them through that transition. We're going to miss them dearly, both Brent and Jill, and just the way in which they've leveraged their lives and, and spent their lives serving our community and our church uh, over the last six plus years. So please be praying for them as they go through that. They'll be back middle of this week uh, and then be here the rest of the month, but be transitioning and doing a lot of the things that go with a, a move like that. So if you find them, you can encourage them, pray for them, support them during a very both exciting uh, and sad transition for them as they make this transition. As you know, we're in the midst of a series entitled Incarnate, uh, and we've transitioned uh, last week from the two parts of the series. One was talking about how we are called as a people to proclaim Christ's kingdom, to be verbal communicators of who Jesus is and what he did for us, but also uh, we're called to demonstrate Christ's kingdom, to not just talk about it, but to actually live it out and be a living illustration of what that kingdom is to look like, where the, king, the future kingdom, in a sense, dips down into our lives, and we live now as if we're in it then. And so when people b begin to see what it looks like to be loved, to see justice, to see mercy, to see the things that will manifest and be true in his kingdom, it calls them and, and lures them to this Jesus that's the king of that kingdom. So we transitioned that last week. Now we're talking about what does that look like uh, in our lives? What would it look like for us as a church if we were living in light of that kingdom now. And we not just worshiped on Sunday, but we worshiped 24-7, that every aspect of our life was part of worship. And last week we uh, looked at the, the beginning of a passage where God is fleshing out some of these principles and really talking to his people, the Israelites, about how they were not living up to that model that he had for them. Uh, they were just going through the religious motions and going through their religious ceremonies, and he called them back to, what does it look like to truly live a life of worship? To live in light of what God has done in our lives. And so we looked at some of those specifics last week, what he wants from us in terms of just worship. Today we're going to look at the results of it the latter half of that passage. What does it look like? What would it look like if God's people truly worshiped him the way he's called us to worship him. And you're going to see the incredible promises that God makes toward his people when we choose to worship him the way he calls us to. And so I want you to see these images and these pictures and visualize what this would look like in your life, in our lives, in our community, if we were a church, if we were a people who worship God the way he has called us to worship him. And after we look at the results and look at that picture, I want to step back and, and call us to becoming a people who obey the conditions that will see those promises come about. I want to shape that up in an acronym. So we're going to kind of walk and just talk through the passage, but then I want to end it with us looking at an acronym uh, that's going to be an image of these principles in this passage of how we could live in such a way uh, to see God do these things in our midst, right here in our city and in our homes and in our neighborhood. So if you have a Bible with you, open up to Isaiah 58. I'll get you oriented to the passage, and then we'll pray and jump in. Isaiah 58, if you're a 
new with us, you can grab a chair Bible in front of you there and, and turn it open to page 618. 618. I'd encourage you, whether you see the messages are the, the passages on the screen or not, to open up your Bible there because I'll be jumping back and forth a lot as we talk about some of the things in here and it'll be good for you to see them right here in your Bible. So grab one uh, in the chair in front of you if you don't have one, turn it open to page 618. If you have your Bible, open it up to Isaiah 58. We're gonna look at the last half of this passage starting in verse eight today. Isaiah 58. Let me pray. And then we'll jump in and look at the results of just worship, what that looks like, what God promises, and then we'll step back and say, how can we become a people that see these results in our own lives? Let's pray. Father, we are just humbled that we can gather today and hear from you, to sing to you, uh, just be uh, present with you that you would be present with us is truly an amazing thought. The God of the universe, the one who spoke all things into creation, takes interest in us. Lord, I pray that as we open your word this morning, that you would open our hearts, you'd open our minds. Lord, that you would speak to each of us individually through your word and through your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would talk to our hearts, that we would see the beauty of who you are and, and your promises that you give to us, and that as we see them, Lord, they would compel us and, and motivate us and move us to pursue you as our greatest delight, that there would be nothing in this world that would be more delightful to us than knowing you, the one who created everything. And Lord, that we would become a people who would see these promises coming true in our lives, in our church, and throughout our city. For your namesake, Lord, and for our good. We love you, and we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Isaiah 58. I want you to see there's a transition in verse eight in this passage. This is why I broke it off here. The first half is really looking at the conditions and the issues that God was addressing. What does it take to worship properly? And he's addressing those issues in them. And then verse eight and on, you're gonna see what's the results. What happens when a group of people choose to worship in this way? And you're gonna see a word throughout this section, uh, like verse eight starts, it says, then, 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 and he's talking about the, the results. If these things were true in our lives, then these things would come about. You would experience these things in your lives. And so I wanna just talk through those results, what would happen and how God would show up and manifest himself if we did that. Last week we looked at the, the key aspects of, of what true worship or proper worship looks like, and he summarized it in two key aspects. One is this true worship, uh, frees people from the oppression of sin. True worship does that. And if you're worshiping truly, if you're engaged in worship, or you're in a community of worship, one of the things you should look for that helps you understand if it's true worship that's taking place are people being freed from the oppression of sin. That means personally, first of all, if you've never been freed from the oppression of sin and, and its power over you, then you might have to ask yourself, am I really worshiping? Have I truly had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ and has he begun to change me? I'm not saying you're sinless. You don't ever make a mistake. I'm saying you're growing and changing and being transformed because you've met the one who came to do that. You should be the first one that comes saying, Lord, how do you want to change me? You should be in a community where you're seeing others being set free from the oppression of sin. It should be a place that welcomes those who are struggling in sin like we have and we do. And in God's presence, they're learning to step out of that. He's changing them and transforming them. That we're not a church that's huddled up to be safe here. We're a church that's being mobilized to go out and impact our city and set other people free from the oppression of sin. 
And that's the other aspect, those structures that, that exist because of sin in our community that we are engaged in helping people step out of that. The other thing that he talked about in that passage is that we're a people who serve those in need. A community that sets people free from the oppression of sin, where we're being set free, they're being set free, our community's being set free, but we serve those in need. We serve those who have needs because we are a people who have been served in our need, that Jesus came and served in our need. That was the heart of it. Now we're going to look at the results. So what happens when we become this kind of people? And verse 8 starts that. Now let's just walk through these and look at this passage and see that the results, the promises God makes to a people who keep those things front and center in their worship. He says, then, in verse 8, then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. You're going to see a lot of images or metaphors he uses, and I'll explain those as we go and summarize them. But he says, your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn your back, your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Uh, let me just show you real quickly three results we see in this passage of what true or proper worship results in, what God is promising here. And, and, and each of these has many facets to it. But the first thing we see is that our proper worship just results in the powerful presence of God. Now, let's look at these images. You can just set your notes down for now and just look through these, and then we'll look at what we're called to in a minute. But look at what happens, that proper worship results in the powerful presence of God. He says in verse 8, Then shall your light break forth like the dawn. Your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. He talks about these different things that take place in our life, and he uses this image of light, and you see that throughout the book of Isaiah and really throughout the scriptures. And light is a metaphor of God's presence in our life. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? He said what? You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. You don't take your light and, and hide it under a basket. You let it shine. Where does that light come from? Why are we the light of the world? Because of God's presence in our life. And that's what Isaiah is saying here. And when we, when we become this kind of people, when we worship God truly, then our light will break forth like the dawn, like the morning sun. It will be present throughout our community, throughout the world, if God's people would, would, would live this way. Your healing will spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. Where does our righteousness come from? from God himself. He is our righteousness. He's saying, hey, his righteousness will go before you, and his glory will be your rear guard. He's using this image of, of when we worship God the way he has called us to worship, that his presence becomes mighty in our lives. And that presence brings about many, many different things. It brings healing, as you see in verse 8. It brings protection. He's before us and afterwards. He brings provision or his intimacy, meaning when I call, he answers. He says, here I am. In those times in your life, 
when you feel like God's never answering your prayers, or maybe you go through extended periods, sometimes we as Christians just stop praying because he never answers our prayers, and we never stop to say, am I doing what he wants me to do? If we stop and examine our prayers and look at them, oftentimes what litters our prayers is, God, will you do this for me? Here's my agenda. Here's what I want done. God, you do this for me. Who's God in that situation? We are. We need to come to a place where we say, God, this is your agenda. Often the things we pray about, we don't even need to pray about. Gee, should I love my wife today? I'm going to pray about that one. You know, most of the stuff, we just are supposed to obey it. You don't pray about whether you should obey or not. You pray for the strength to do so, and you pray that God would break your heart and change your heart so that you delight in doing what he wants you to do. But we often pray just for more stuff. We pray just for ourselves personally and what we want and not necessarily what God wants. And he's saying, when we make his agenda our agenda, just watch how that transforms your prayer life because when you call on me, I will answer you, he's saying. When your life is leveraged for my purposes, then I am fully behind you. God says that many places in the scriptures, and we see that here. We see our influence becomes great. Look in verse 10. He says, he says, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. He's talking about different circumstances that even in the midst of darkness and the dark world that we might live in or the dark home we might be in or the workplace, he says, your light will rise even in the darkness. You will have influence even in places where everything else is negative. He says, your gloom, meaning even in your worst moments and your gloominess, it's going to be like the noonday. The brightest part of the day on this earth is what your life will be like even in your most difficult, gloomy moments when you are giving your life for his purposes. Satisfaction, he says, in all circumstances and guidance. Look at the images he uses in this passage. In verse 11, he says, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places. And we can relate to that here in Laredo, can't we? To satisfy our desires in scorched places, thinking of walking through a desert with no water and him being a constant source of water for you. How powerful that image is. Make your bones strong, he said. You'll be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. He's talking about satisfaction even in difficult times. He's talking about impact. He says, your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You'll raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Think about this. When we allow sin to dominate our lives, we cause ripple effects of damage throughout our communities. It starts in our homes. As our homes fall apart and sin begins ransacking our homes and our families. And then it trickles out into our families as we engage in things in our workplaces and out in the community that go against what God has called us to be. Suddenly we become destroyers and deceivers in our city. And man, we know this here. There's so much deception, so much sin, so much destruction, unsafety, a lack of safety and, and protection in places in our city. And God's saying, that's not what I have for you, my people. If you will obey me, if you will worship me truly, then you won't be destroyers in your city. You'll be rebuilders. You'll be restorers. You'll be the ones that, that people will say, Wow, they're the ones that, that repaired the breach, the brokenness in our city. God used them to restore things that were broken and bring safety and health to their city. All these images we see packed in this passage of what it looks like and how God shows up when we worship him properly. We see in this passage, I love in verse 13, a key principle that our proper worship results in great delight in God. Not just the powerful presence of him in our lives, but in great delight in him. He says in verse 13, if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, 
I mean, this time of worship a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasures or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. Man, that is the most important condition of our hearts. Do you know that? There is no more significant condition in our lives than how we respond to God and what we think about when we think about Him in delighting in Him. There's no greater gift He could give you than for you to delight in Him. Because every single brokenness in our bodies, in our lives, every single hurt, every single sin we engage in boils down to this one simple concept, delight. When you delight in anything more than you delight in God, you sin. It doesn't mean you can't delight in something else. I didn't say that he doesn't give us lots of things to delight in, but it's a level of magnitude and priority. When you delight in anything more than you delight in God, you sin. And you live righteously when you delight in God more than you delight in anything else. Nothing is a better indicator of your relationship with God than your delight in Him or your lack thereof. And when you delight in him, it's not work to do the things that he wants you to do. You don't have to, oh man, it's Sunday again. I got to get up and go to church. I mean, it's daylight savings. I lost an hour of sleep. Come on, Lord, just cut me some slack. Man, delight says, I'm there. I don't care. This is the most important part of my week when I gather with his people and, and remember and sit and worship him in their presence. Delight says, this is no duty. It's who I am. The greatest gift you've been given is to delight in him. Let me just flesh this out for you in, a, in kind of a, a silly illustration, but it, it'll help you get the picture of why delighting in God is so important. Let's just pretend for a moment that someone gave you the gift of delighting in everything you had to do in your work. Okay, so Monday morning comes, and rather than typically, you know, Sunday evening comes, you're like, oh, man, i got to go back to work tomorrow, and my boss is just a drag, and the people I work with just really bring me down. What if it was like, oh, man, work? I just delight in my work, and every single mundane task that your boss gives you, you absolutely ate it up. I mean, you were so excited, you practically pee your pants when he asks you to, you know, to clean out the bathrooms and do these silly little tasks. You just delighted in it. Man, you are fired up. I mean, wives, let me, let me make it personal for you. What if, what if your husband's so delighted in doing the dishes and folding laundry that whenever you asked him, they went, oh my goodness, honey, I'm so glad you asked me that. In fact, I have got to take you out for dinner tonight because you, I just love doing that stuff. Okay, guys, that's not really sinking in for you. Let, let, me, let me connect something with you. Now, we're talking about delight. Let's just pretend these things absolutely delighted you. So, husband, I'll get on your wavelength a little bit. Let's say, and I'm talking to husbands. Say this with me. Say husbands. Say husbands. Okay, I'm not talking to single guys. I'm not talking about unmarried guys. I'm talking to husbands here. Do not quote me outside that context, okay? Let's say husbands, you go to your wife and you say, what if, what if every time you went to her and said, hey, honey, how about we get naked later tonight? She goes, I cannot get these clothes off fast enough, honey. I just delight in that. Amen, Amen. all right. Pre Preach it, brother. Kids, what if homework was your absolute delight. And every time your teacher piled on homework over spring break, you went, man, I'm going to have the best spring break ever. They gave me homework. I'd delight to do that. That sounds silly, but it would be awesome, wouldn't it? If you delighted to do the things that you had to do, it would be the greatest gift you could ever be given. That's why it's the greatest gift God gives to his children. When you have met the Lord Jesus Christ and he has changed your life and you see God for the first time as he really is not a religious re religion thing that you fulfill your duty to measure up to, but one who has come in and so changed and transformed your world and met you in the midst of your muck 
that your heart now is totally transformed. And now what was duty has become delight. That's what God's talking about here. When you make him number one, when you have an encounter with him and recognize what he has done for you, your heart begins to be filled with delight for the things that delight him. And that changes everything. So how can we receive this mighty presence? How can we experience God's powerful presence with us and and a, and a heart that delights in what he delights in? I want to leave you with this acronym, these four things that I think are focal points for us as a church, for us as individuals, and it spells the word hope. And in particular, I want us to look at it in light of where he's put us, hope for Laredo, hope for this city. How can we bring hope to the city in which he has placed us. The first one is holy living. The H stands for holy living. As you look through this passage, that theme runs through this whole passage. What does holy living look like? It looks like living that's consistent with who God has called us to be. That what's first to him is first to us. That we are a people who are here to set others free from the oppression of sin, not from us, but through Jesus in our lives, that we are communicating that message, that we're living consistently, that we're not people that go around talking about Jesus and what he can do, and then living no different than the rest of the world, that people look at us and say, why doesn't this guy cheat in his business? Why is this guy faithful to his wife? Why does he spend time with his kids and teach them a different type of character and living than everyone else does that I see around me. Why are they so different? Because there are people who are committed to holy living. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that same thing in our series we looked at uh, in the fall, our God Attitude series, and it was the entry point of a relationship with him. He said the first beatitude was this, that blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Meaning the ones who receive the kingdom of heaven, who experience the presence of the person who rules in the kingdom of heaven, are those who are poor in spirit or humble. They're broken. They realize they bring nothing to the table. And they call out and say, God, if you don't change me, if you don't transform the desires in my heart that long for the evil and and selfish things of this world, if you don't change me, I'm hopeless. But if you do, I recognize how needy I am. And if you'll come into my life and, and change me, then my life is yours. Holy living. What if we started there? What if we became a people who didn't just talk about our faith on Sunday, but we lived it out Monday through Saturday? The second thing is the O, and that's offering ourselves for others. Offering myself for others. We saw that more in the first seven verses, but even in here, Isaiah interjects it. He says, if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out, for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted. It's giving ourselves for others. We, we need to reject the mindset that says it's all about me. Even the mindset that's crept into the Christian faith that says God's just up there to bless us in a worldly sense and make our life more comfortable and make us more prosperous here on this earth. And, and all we've done is taken Christianity and baptized it with the worldly view that God exists to make me comfortable. Really, is that the life that Jesus modeled for us? Or did he uh, model a life that says, this world isn't where we are ending up. So let's leverage the things that we have here for the kingdom that is coming. Let's give ourselves for the sake of others. It's not about how many toys I can collect or how many clothes I can purchase or cars I can own. I mean, to be totally honest, if Jesus wrote the bumper sticker, it would say, he who dies with the most toys loses. Because Jesus says, 
Not that you shouldn't have treasures. Not that he doesn't want you to have treasures. He wants you to have the best treasures. In Matthew 6, 19, he, he says this, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. And then he tells us why. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And he doesn't go on and say, just get rid of everything. You, don't, you shouldn't have anything be poor and, and this, that's what life's going to be like. He doesn't say that. He says, but instead, store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy and where thieves can't break in and steal. Jesus says, take what we have now and use it to impact our community, not to build our lifestyle or to create our kingdom, but to pour out and give of ourselves for the sake of others. Because then you build a treasure in heaven that no one can ever touch, that rust will never destroy, and thieves cannot take away. What if we lived as a people with a mindset that says, our lives, our treasures, our talents are for you, God. And we want to leave this community, my home, my neighborhood, my workplace, a better place than it was when I showed up there first. What if we were those repairers? What if we were those restorers and we poured ourselves out for the sake of our community, rather than the mindset that typically exists of how can I use this community to build my personal wealth? How different would that be in our city? We have a number of organizations that we give thousands of dollars to every year as a church that may be a, a place for you to, to partner with, but you can do this anywhere. But uh, several of them are, if you walk out our foyer and walk down that hallway towards the restroom, you'll see all the different missions groups that we partner with and are engaged with. And like Casa Sofonias, the orphanage uh, that's now in Victoria, but used to be right across the border in Nuevo Laredo. Uh, there's a place where you can have an impact on others and pour yourself out for those who are in great need. Laredo Life Center is one where they help uh, unwed mothers who are thinking of, of aborting their child keep a child. And they offer them hope and they come alongside and help them. And many people in our church serve with them and counsel these women. And we provide resources to help them do that. An unwed mother that's scared to death, how am I going to raise this child? What if we were a people that came alongside them and said, we'll help you because we believe every life is valuable to God? What about uh, veterans serving the need? Gigi Ramos, who comes here, uh, is the president of Veterans Serving the Need, and, and they help out just that. Veterans uh, who are in great need, uh, struggling financially or physically, whatever that may be, and they provide all kinds of resources and help for them. Uh, right here in our community. I think of Victorious Christian Harvesters, a missions organization here, and Bob and Kathleen Gableman, who are missionaries here that we support, do both of these things. They go throughout Latin America, training churches to share the gospel uh, with the people in their communities, and then they bring in beans and rice and, and medicine and do all kinds of things they can do to help meet the physical needs of people in those particular areas. You could support a group like that. You could pray for them. You could support them. You could talk to them and find out how you could participate in what they're doing. I think of World Vision, an organization we've partnered with and, and did a journey to Jama uh, a number of years ago where over 100 of our people adopted a child in some other part of the world uh, who is starving. And now through just a handful of dollars a, a month uh, are providing both spiritual care and physical care for them. What if those kinds of things characterized our life? What if that's what we realized we were all about? Meeting the needs that exist in our community, offering ourselves for others. The third thing is the P in hope. Pray persistently. Pray persistently. Nothing communicates a person's delight in God more than prayer it does. Prayer is simply being with, talking to, and listening to God. I was thinking, how, how can I help capture this? And maybe no better picture captures this than, than, than just a season of life that my wife and I are in with our younger 
two daughters. And kids are always like this in this season. Our youngest daughter, Macy, is five and, and Maya is seven. And at that age, there's nothing that delights them more than just being as close to mom and dad as they possibly can. Sometimes it drives you nuts, right, because they're like latched onto your hip all the time, but sometimes you just find great delight in it. And we'll sit on the couch sometimes in the evening, and they cannot get any closer to you when they're sitting. In fact, they're like climbing right up on your lap. Just want to be right here. And Macy, we always say for Macy, that, that fills her tank. It's like, oh, your tank's a little empty, isn't it? So you just kind of grab her and snuggle her in, and she just smiles, and, and you realize her greatest delight is just being in the presence of her parents. I think that's prayer in a nutshell. It's just so much wanting to be with your dad that nothing else would satisfy you like that. What if we were a people who fully understood how good our God is, our Father is, and rather than rushing out the door, first thing, saying, I just don't have time to pray. I'll pray in the car as I drive. And all those things are great things. But what if we couldn't wait to maybe get up a few minutes early or just get to work a few minutes later because we just said, I, I just want to sit with you for a little bit. Dad, I just want to be in your presence. There's nothing like being with you. And as we prayed, we prayed for the people that we see in our lives who don't have that delight, who are lost because they don't know their true father. Hope. The E is our last one. The E is expect God to show up. Expect God to show up. And it's, in a nutshell, it's, it's what I say is believing the thens in this passage. What if we really believed that if we became a people like this, that God would be true to what he says, then this would happen. Then I'd be present with you. Then you would delight in me. Then I would fulfill your purpose in life through your life. What if we expected him to show up? I mean, too often we come to church and the last person we expect to meet is God. We prepare ourselves for everyone else. We dress a certain way because of the other people we might bump into, and then we cover up our hearts from really engaging with God. What, what if the first person we expected to meet when we got up on Sunday mornings and came to church, the most important person we said was God? What if we expected to meet him face to face? How different would we prepare for worship? if we expected him to be here? And better yet, how different would we live 24-7 if we expected God to be true to these promises everywhere we lived? You know, Israel never became this people. They never fulfilled this commission that Isaiah gave them. They never experienced these blessings, these promises that God had for them. But someone has and someone did for them what they could not do. Jesus Christ came as their Messiah, their Savior, and yours and mine. And he lived this life. He lived a perfectly holy life. He obeyed the Father perfectly, and he offered his life for the sake of others. He didn't come to take from you. He came to offer something to you. He laid down his life for your sake and for mine. He prayed persistently for you. The scriptures say in Hebrews that even now he intercedes for us. He constantly prays for us before the Father. And he had the courage to live like he lived, because he expected and believed with all his heart that God was good to his promises. Jesus did these things for us so that we could be made right with God, so that we could delight in God. And when he saw us trapped and oppressed by sin, he became sin for you and for me. When he saw us poor and unable to be rightly related with a perfect and holy God, he became poor so that he could share his riches 
with you and me? What if we now became those kinds of people? What if we became hope for our city like Jesus became hope for us? I want to prepare you for a time of personal prayer right now, a time of confession and even worship. And I want you to just ponder which aspect of hope is God speaking to you about right now? Is it the holy living? Is it maybe a selflessness? Maybe you, you've been religious and you've done a lot of good things, but you're really still living for yourself, and God's challenging you to say, how can I pour my life out for others? Maybe it's that prayer and just delighting to be with him. Or maybe it's just kind of giving up and saying, God, I don't, I don't know if you're going to show up in my life. And you need him to develop an expectancy in you that says, yes, you are good to your promises. I want to ask you during this time to just seek him out, to confess whatever it is you need to deal with, to pray about it, to worship him as we sing this song. And we're going to have uh, people throughout the sanctuary, a uh, prayer team, they'll have a little lanyard on that can pray with you and for you. If you want someone to pray with you, I want to encourage you to come up or go back to one of them and just, just tell them which area. Uh, it's holy living I need you to pray for. It's, it's offering myself. It's praying persistently. It's expecting God's promises. Just give them that one word and let them pray with you and for you. As we sing, let's ask for God to fill this place, to fill us and to empower us and to make us the people that he has called us to be. Lord, forgive us that we are overcome by so many other things in this world, Lord. By injustices, by people, by situations, by circumstances, all of which may be legitimate things to be overcome by. But Lord, nothing should overcome us more than you. Lord, nothing should grip us more than you. So, Lord, fill our hearts that our deepest delight, our greatest desire would be you. So that anything that hinders us, anything that keeps us, anything that holds us back from offering ourselves completely to you would be just purged from our lives. We worship you today. We praise you and we pray that you will change us as your people. Lord Jesus, thank you for becoming for us what we could never have become ourselves. And as we love you, as we pursue you, continue to change our desires into yours. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. As we close, I'm just going to ask you to sit down and close your eyes for a minute and imagine something. Imagine these things in your life, in your home, in your community. So just close your eyes and, and just imagine your life lived out in light of these promises that we just read about. Consider the freedom you would experience if the bondage of sin was no longer damaging your life, your family, your schools, your workplace, but instead holy living was shining and penetrating your personal world. Imagine the satisfaction you would experience if your greatest delight was simply the person and presence of God, that no matter what circumstance or situation you found yourself in, you were filled with delight because your God was with you. What impact would your life have if you began offering yourself for others? If you stopped viewing your resources, your talents, your time is simply your own, but began pouring them out for the sake of others. If you began using your life to transform the lives of others, and if people's eternity was completely changed because you stepped out and God showed up. What if your life was regularly characterized by intercessory prayer for people in your city and for our city? 
What if because of your commitment to holiness and selflessness, you began to see God answer your prayers in amazing ways, things you never thought possible coming about? And what if we became a people who lived with expectancy, believing so much that God is true to his word that we would bank our lives on it? Could you imagine the impact a person, or better yet, a whole bunch of people would have on their community if they would choose to live this way? Lord Jesus, may this be true in this church and in this community. For your name's sake, we pray. Amen.